So I'm your program chair, and I'm going to give a little longer introduction today because I am excited about our program, which is going to be about Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center. As you may or may not know, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, and when the COVID under five vaccines were coming out, I went to my doctor's office and I was like, hey, can we give get the vaccine for my daughter, and they're like, hey, we don't do those here. And then there's a lot of little pop-up clinics, but the pop-up clinics primarily serve the adult version of the, of the COVID vaccine, like the farmer's market one, they only carry the adult version. So then I found out that the Virginia Garcia Clinic downtown Hillsboro does offer, offer the two to five six months to five years and I was amazed at how easy it was to get in there I showed up looking just like a frantic dad with my child in arm and it said appointment only and they were like no you can just come in and it was super easy to get all of her doses there so I was really excited when I had the opportunity to bring Julie Titus she's gonna be our speaker today she's a development associate with Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Foundation. She's got her bachelor's from McAllister College. She's got several years of experience doing development fundraising. And, check my notes here. When she is not active, she's an avid gardener and lives here in Washington County. So please join me in giving a warm rotary welcome to Julie Titus. Thank you, Lucas. I'm so glad to hear uh, you had a great vaccination experience for your daughter with us. Um, and just very excited to be here with you all today. Uh, as Lucas said, I'm Julie Titus, a development associate with Virginia Garcia Memorial Foundation. Uh, I've been uh, with Virginia Garcia since 2017. Um, and I'm sure a little rotary connection uh, for, for you guys. My, uh, I've, Really, first became familiar with uh, Rotary's mission. My husband's uncle was a district governor in North Carolina, and got to kind of see a lot of the um, just really community-minded uh, activities they were doing there, in addition to the uh, to the international work around polio eradication. And so, thank you for all of the important work that you guys do in our community as well. Um, so, I am looking forward to sharing with you about our organization and some of the. Um, the projects that we've been up to, the patients that we're serving. Um, I'll leave some time for questions, but feel, please feel free to just interrupt me with questions as we're going as well. Um, and yeah, let's move to our. Okay, great. So um, I'm guessing that most of you are somewhat familiar with Virginia Garcia, but I want to share with you a little bit more about our uh, history. Um, so this is Virginia Garcia. Uh, in 1975, she was the six-year-old daughter of migrant farm workers. So she traveled with her parents from Mission, Texas to California, and then somewhere along the way here to Oregon, she got a cut on her foot, and it got infected. And because of cultural, financial, and language barriers, she did not have access to the health care that she needed and her infection turned septic and she died. Which is a totally unacceptable and preventable tragedy. Uh, and community leaders in Cornelius, um, which is where her family was working at the time, they organized and said, this cannot happen again. And about two weeks later, opened the first Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center out of a three-car garage. garage here. Um, and that's, um, that was across the street from where our clinic in Cornelius is today. Is, um, uh, uh, the, the garage was actually, uh, Central Cultural had planned um, a mechanic uh, certification program, uh, but they, the community said the health center is a bigger need, and so they used the garage for that purpose at that time. Um, clearly, we've grown a lot as an organization since we were you know, operating out of a garage. Uh, but the sort of barriers that Virginia faced are still incredibly prevalent throughout our community. And so we you know, continue with our mission to make sure that 
everyone has access to high quality, culturally appropriate health care. Um, and uh, we're in, um, you know, in, in Washington and Yamhill counties. Uh, and we have a special emphasis still on serving migrant and seasonal farm workers, although we also serve anyone, um, especially those who have uh, barriers to accessing care. Um, so, just a little bit about where, where we are today. Um, we are now serving over 52,000 patients uh, in these two counties, so that's about one out of every 14 people in our community is a patient with Virginia Garcia. And uh, we have uh, five, we have 18 clinic sites. So we've got five primary care clinics. So in um, Cornelius, Beaverton, Hillsborough, McMinnville, and Newburgh. Uh, we've got dental clinics at all of those sites as well, including uh, we've got two dental sites in, uh, in Beaverton. Uh, we've got by, uh, school based health centers, um, uh, including here in Forest Grove uh, at the high schools, one of our clinics, uh, and also in. Uh, in, in Beaverton, Hillsboro, out in Willamina, we have a school-based health center, so it's like in the coast range there, um, very edge of Danville County, uh, and then also in, um, in Tiger. Uh, we've got uh, a reproductive care clinic uh, for our pregnant and newly folks uh, with brand new babies, uh, that's in Hillsboro, and then in, um, in May last year we opened our uh, COVID uh, care clinic, our 7th Avenue uh, clinic in Hillsboro that, that Lucas mentioned, which is uh, in partnership with, uh, with the county uh, in providing access to COVID vaccinations, testing, and therapeutics, not just for our patients, but for anybody in the, in the community. And we also have a mobile clinic. So we go to where our patients are uh, in need. So we, our mobile clinic in the summer months, we are at Farms uh, with on-site worker housing. We're at nurseries, uh, seeing workers there. Uh, we also use our mobile clinic for providing um, health screenings at community events, um, and also yeah, we've used it a lot for various um, mobile vaccination as, events as well. And our our, uh, our mobile clinic uh, is set up to do both medical and dental care, so we can provide both of that. Uh, well, this is just a bit of a map of kind of about where around where we are. All over here. Um, so, yeah, sharing a bit about our patients. As I mentioned, anyone can be a patient, Virginia Garcia, uh, but primarily our patients are low income. 98% uh, of our patients are 150% uh, of the, but earning that much or less at the federal poverty level. So per family of four, that's about $42,000 a year. Uh, and we see patients, whether or not they have insurance, about 30% of our patients do not have insurance. Uh, about half of our patients are on the Oregon Health Plan, are Medicaid. Uh, and then we also have some patients who uh, are in Medicare or who have private health insurance. Um, but as again, as I mentioned, Anyone is a, that can be a patient with us, and I'll share a little bit more about um, how we help connect our patients with, uh, with coverage, too. Um, we have a lot of young patients. Uh, about 43% of our patients are 21 or younger. Uh, it's a, it's a, and I'll, I'll, some of how we reach uh, a lot of those folks is through our school-based health centers. Um, those are serving generally folks who are uh, 20 years or younger in that school district, so they don't have to be enrolled in the school. Schooled, or you know, we've got a clinic here in Forest Grove. But there's folks in Gaston who will come to the to the site there, uh, uh, and that's um, and then those those sites were providing um, uh, both uh, primary medical care as well as uh, mental and behavioral health services. Um, and the the number of folks that we're seeing who are farm workers is uh, right now about 18 percent of our of our patients that number has continued to shrink as we've grown and served larger percentages of other populations, but it's absolutely still uh, a priority for us to make sure that the farm workers uh, can be seen immediately when they need care, especially folks who are migrant farm workers. We see them now because next week they might be up in Washington and not have access to the care there, for example, so that's really important for us. Um, so 
So to share here a little bit about the, the services that we offer, we think of healthcare as you know, pretty broadly. It's not just okay, what we can do in the exam room for our patients. We know that there are so many factors that impact our patients' health uh, outside of the exam room. So uh, we've got a lot of general health services, but also uh, wellness programming. Uh, in some of our clinics, we have space for Hopefully we can get this back up and going again with <laughs> safe for what we have in Zumba classes and we've got teaching kitchens. Um, we help make sure that our patients are now uh, familiar with not just, we don't want to say just like don't eat that, but like here's a meal you put with ingredients you're familiar with that's going to you know, help manage your chronic health condition. Um, we also uh, uh, have uh, addiction medicine services. We are uh, providing uh, resource referral for our for our patients. Um, so we're working on the health of our, of our patients, but we also know uh, if someone doesn't have uh, access to food or they have you know, housing instability, those sorts of things are going to have tremendous impact on their health as well. And so we connect with um, well, partnerships is a really important piece of our work, so connecting um, our patients with partner organizations in the community who are focused on food access or housing uh, or all those sorts of things so that you know, our patients have those needs addressed as well. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got, um, you know, during the primary medical care, we've got dental clinics um, providing mental and behavioral health services right there in those clinics is also really important. Um, there's still so much stigma around receiving mental health care. It's wonderful for our providers to be able to do a kind of a warm handoff in the clinic and say like, hey, you know, like, this is where you're going to get your behavioral or mental health. And people can just, yeah, I'm just going to my doctor's office because that's it, it. Absolutely. It's just part of your health care. Um, we also have pharmacies at all of our primary care clinic sites. Uh, access to affordable prescription medication is, uh, is really important. Uh, and we know if someone is traveling by public transportation, to see us and they have, you know, kids in tow or whatever, it's just making an extra stop somewhere else to go pick up that medication sometimes does not happen. So we want to say, you're here, let's get that to you right now. Uh, and we are part of the, it's called the 340B pharmacy program, which basically means we can provide the most discounted uh, prices for our patients. Um, I, uh, I get to hear a lot of stories about um, kind of the clinical side of things from my husband who was a nurse with Virginia Garcia. Uh, kind of followed him over here actually. But after hearing all of his stories about the uh, heroic efforts that our staff go to to take care of people, I uh, want to be a part of that too. Um, but he shared the example the other the other day is one of our patients um, was trying to fill their prescription at, at Costco and it was very expensive. I think it was an asthma medication. Um, and we were able to get it through, you know, through our pharmacy to, for this, this patient for about 10% of the costs that they were able to get elsewhere. So um, it's just a really you know, important savings for our patients as well. Um, oh, and the insurance eligibility piece that I, that I would mention about it. You did say we could interrupt, right? Yes, please. So on the issue of medicine, if, if the patient as Oregon Health Plan is being seen through a different medical system like OHSU. Can they get their meds through your pharmacy or only your patients get to use your pharmacy? Only our patients uh, can, um, it's because of the, the 340B program that only our patients can uh, use our pharmacy. And is your pharmacy a compound pharmacy as well? I don't know. Okay. We're doing that. I'm good. Thank I, you. I, can, I can see if I can find out. Um, we were able to recently um, expand access for our patients to get the same prices that they get through our pharmacies at other pharmacies. So, like, I, I can't remember which ones we partnered with, but like uh, maybe Rite Aid and um, Albertsons and some other other pharmacies. Our patients can get their get that preferred pricing at other locations, which may be more convenient for them to get a refill than to come to our clinic, depending on. Um, and then the uh, insurance eligibility piece is uh, folks who are on the Oregon Health Plan need to re-enroll every year, and so we, we work to help make sure that our patients uh, maintain 
uh, that coverage because having you know, loss of insurance coverage can be really devastating. So we try to work on that. Yeah. Got a question on that since a big portion of my group, it seems like moving state to state and having foreign health plan Medicaid administered by the states. Is there a is there a way for them to hand off or say or kind of identify that I don't that I'm or is it just a gathering system? Like if I move to Washington. Yeah, so Oregon Health Plan is for Oregon residents only. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of people we certainly do not have insurance uh, because they're they're traveling through here. So they although they may have, I don't I honestly don't know how it works if someone is you know they're from Texas but they're we're seeing them here as a as a home worker. Um, but I think it's uh, there's essentially as as a federally qualified health center we're seeing those people regardless and there's some system on the back end for payment or not sometimes as well. <laughs> so if I was to dumb that down for, for the people over here in the red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so regardless of how cloudy their immigration status, they could still be seen at Virginia Garcia. Absolutely. We serve anyone. Every human deserves great health care. So no matter where you're from or what language you speak or what papers you have, you can be our patient. Yeah. Okay, just to be clear. Yes, thank you. Love to, love to highlight that. Um, and um, we mentioned that, that here as well. The, um, so we're a federally qualified <coughs> health center. And these, um, there's, there's the mic. That's okay, I can just talk louder. Yeah, I works too. Right. Use your casino voice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what it says. Dead battery explanation. <laughs> um, right, so uh, federally qualified health centers exist to make sure that anybody can have access to health care, uh, especially those who are, are facing barriers. And so we don't turn anybody away, regardless of their ability to pay or their insurance status. Um, and we're not a free clinic, uh, but it's a sliding scale. Um, and then again, if, if, if people have no ability to pay, we will still see that's um, And then our funding uh, comes from a wide variety of sources. Uh, the bulk of it is, uh, as a federally qualified health center, there's federal grants uh, for, uh, for us as a health center. Um, there's also insurance payments like from the, from the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, there's support from uh, uh, from the state and counties we're working in some of the cities uh, that we're in as well. Uh, there's some patient fees, co-pays, pieces, you know, that adds it for, for some pieces of it. Um, and then also support from uh, private and corporate foundations, from businesses and organizations and um, individual donors and kind of anywhere where money can come from. We are very <laughs> happy to put it to use uh, in supporting our patients. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our um, pandemic responses. It's just been such a huge part of our work for the last three years. Three years. Kind of amazing to think about that too. Um, at the, we saw very clearly at the outset of the pandemic that COVID was impacting our patient population much more than population at whole. Our, our patients are, um, about 55% of our patients are Hispanic or Latinx. Um, and we saw our patients testing positive for COVID when testing was available enough, um, 20 times higher than the state average. Uh, our patients were much more vulnerable because they, most of them had jobs where they could not work from home or live in, uh, in, uh, in households that have a more density of people, and have spent more people for, for space, and just, um, we worked uh, to prioritize access for our patients to vaccines when they were available, um, in addition to providing, using our mobile clinic to do screening events all over, I remember, uh, I remember McMinnville in the, I think it was summer of 2020, it was like 400 people in one day that we were able to, uh, to screen for, for COVID, which is like, how can we bring access to, to people? Um, so lots of this, you know, testing and vaccination events that we've done. To date, we have provided over 92,000 doses of COVID vaccine uh, throughout, throughout the community. And that's for, uh, for our patients, but also for um, 
in, in the community at large. We did a lot of partnership with the, with the state and, uh, and the counties that we're working in to just bring access. Uh, our uh, Virginia Garcia, having been around for 48 years now, uh, has become a trusted name in the community for a lot of folks who may not have trust in other institutions. And so we were really grateful to be able to use that to help encourage people to you know that it's, it's, it's yes, the vaccine is, is safe and effective, and no, you don't need to have an ID or insurance to get it, um, and to, to help make sure that um, yeah, the folks were able to benefit from, uh, from the, the vaccine. Uh, very early on in the pandemic, it was like, how do we help our patients stay healthy at home? It's like, may I mean, not have a thermometer. How do you know if you have a fever? We'll mail you a thermometer. You have high blood pressure. Like, you don't have, you only get that checked when you come into the clinic. We're gonna mail you a blood pressure you can help tra uh, track that at home. Um, also uh, supporting our patients with uh, becoming a navigator organization for the Oregon Worker Relief Fund, which was established to help make sure that uh, folks who were not eligible for the federal economic uh, relief checks or unemployment uh, could still have access to, uh, to some really needed funding. This is you know, primarily uh, undocumented patients. Um, we also uh, just been, you know, continuing to uh, provide COVID services now as much as we can out of the uh, out of the, the Hillsborough Seventh Avenue Clinic uh, to help free up our uh, our primary care sites for all of the other patient health needs uh, that are happening there. Um, so that's a, a lot about the pandemic. It's still, it's still here. There's a lot of COVID uh, treatment to be going doing now, but we're really also glad that there's a, uh, we're able to start focusing more on some other, uh, or back on all the other things that patients have too. Uh, and that, uh, just wanted to briefly touch on a, a, an exciting project uh, for us is uh, expanding our clinic in Newburgh. Uh, we first opened our clinic there in 2014, uh, and we have basically outgrown the space uh, and so uh, last year we, uh, we, able, we were able to purchase the building that we've been leasing uh, and we've got a groundbreaking uh, that's going to be starting later this, this spring on this project. But the idea is that we'd love to, uh, in, in Newburgh, have the same sort of uh, wellness center resources uh, that we have in, at our Cornelius site. They all have that in Newburgh. So to be able to have a, wellness, a space for wellness programming, to have a, a teaching kitchen there, to be able to um, uh, expand our, our pharmacy space right there. Is, or right now, it's very small, so we would have, we would be able to have a full pharmacy uh, as well as um, double the capacity for the number of patients that we're serving. Right now, we're serving about 3,000 patients a year, uh, but we know that there's a, a huge gap in, uh, or there's a huge uh, need in uh, providers who are serving uh, patients uh, who are on uh, or the Oregon Health Plan or who are, who are insured. that's uh, kind of on the horizon for us. Uh, and uh, really about our foundation. So I work for our, our, our foundation, which really exists solely to support our health center, uh, but we created a, a separate uh, organization to be able, because as a federally qualified health center, our, uh, our board of directors is made up of uh, at least 50% patients, or a patient-directed organization. Uh, and then our foundation board of directors is more uh, community <coughs> leaders and connections and folks who can help us uh, build build relationships and funds uh, for the work that we're doing. So we, our foundation organizes uh, some fundraising and uh, some educational events as well as um, yeah, meeting out in the community like we've got. Um, and we absolutely rely on community support for the work that, that we're doing uh, and would be very grateful if you guys consider uh, a gift of $1,000 to Virginia Garcia. Uh, it's a part of our work. We'd love to talk with whoever the right people are about that. Uh, uh, there's uh, also some volunteer opportunities. Primarily, uh, right now, we're looking for folks to help this summer with our uh, at the migrant camps. Uh, we do ask the volunteers to speak Spanish for that, so I know that it's a lot of uh, 
database, but that's, that's like the need that we have. Um, and we do also have um, some other we're, some other limited opportunities, but we have a, a new volunteer coordinator who's working to expand those opportunities. So I'd love to, if you guys are interested, I can definitely talk with you guys about that later too. Um, other ways to help is, you know, if any of your businesses would be uh, interested in, uh, in supporting Virginia Garcia or finding out more, we'd love to come and uh, talk with your uh, folks at, uh, at work or, or even personally if you'd like to host a, a fundraiser for us with your friends and neighbors and colleagues, well, happy to help you make that happen as well. Um, and you know, some, some uh, corporate sponsorships for events that we, that we do are also an important piece of our, uh, of our fundraising puzzle so that our events themselves, the funds donated, can go to, the, to our work instead of catering and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, you can just follow us on social media and share about what we're doing too. It's another great way to support us. And I brought uh, a few, some copies of our uh, little annual report summary. It's got a QR code on the back to the link to the whole thing and some of my business cards up here too. So I uh, would love to connect with you guys later as well. Um, but what, what questions do you guys have? So on your first slide, uh, in the, on the mission statement, it, it, it was a phrase that said to provide culturally appropriate that, I found that fascinating and intriguing and compelling, and I'm sure some of it in your presentation was self-explanatory, but I'm curious your, maybe to elaborate on that. What is culturally appropriate healthcare? Yeah, so we think it's incredibly important that people receive healthcare in a language that they're comfortable with. Uh, and then as much as possible, our providers work to become familiar with the cultures of patients that we're serving. So uh, it may be that, of course, if we're going to get a, uh, an interpreter for one of our, um, uh, you know, in, in Farsi for one of our Muslim patients, that that should, and it's a female patient, the interpreter should be female. Like there's some, some things that we that are uh, that we know would be um, that make an impact on the our patient's comfort. Um, it's you know, we can't our our, our provide we our patients speak over 60 different languages. We are not able to serve <laughs> folks, you know, uh, directly in all those languages, but you know, otherwise it's you know through an interpreter service. And also, our providers can't know everything about all of those those cultures. But uh, we have a, a a focus on on doing our best to understand that and provide that sort of appropriate care. Is that yeah, that's no, awesome. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yes, uh, you said that you had 52,000 people in a year of which 43% were under 21. I want to know how many do your doctors now take call or do they supply after hours visits? Um, so some of our clinics are, uh, are open um, till like 7 p.m. just regularly, as uh, actually most of them are, so, so folks can they don't go after after school or whatever you know, to, to have have an appointment. Our um, our OBGYN providers who are doing delivery they're absolutely on call. Uh, we do have um, uh, uh, our, our general clinic hours. We've got you know, our staff after, but we have the providers who are on on call to answer emergency uh, calls as well. We're not in, we're, we don't provide emergency care, but yes, there is somebody available. What I, uh, being an ex-pediatrician and having taken care of a number of Virginia Garcia patients, I was just wondering because you, for a long time, 15 years ago, you would have your doctors taken care of and at 7 o'clock they would shut the door and then let the rest of the community take call for their patients. Yeah, and we would be responsible for them at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, so that, yeah, we have. We do, I know we do have an on-call number for like if someone calls after hours, there's a provider that they can that they can reach. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how it was previously, but that's my understanding of how it's working now. 
I had the joy of watching your organization actually be more in like a series of, of trailers before you built the building you have. And so it has grown into its own large healthcare organization from its humble beginnings. In those earlier years, though, Virginia Garcia was much more engaged with chambers of commerce here in Cornelius and Forest Grove. Um, I, I haven't had the benefit of seeing you or a representative of your organization at Chamber. There's a number of us in this room who are members of Chamber. So I would love to see you guys be more engaged with us at that level because um, I specifically have a business in Cornelius. My business is probably 60% your people's uh, demographically. And so having your materials in my office is a huge plus. But I haven't seen anybody come around to try to develop a relationship with me from the organization in a long, long time. So I think your question of how to do that is it's, it's a two-way street, and, and so I'll branch out. Hopefully, it'll be received. Yes, thank you so much. It has been it has been a, a bit since I've been able to attend some events, but I'm looking forward to uh, to the luncheon week after next, and uh, it's made everything's coming up. Thank you. How much do you collaborate with, like, uh, for instance, like Pacific Healthcare has a lot of professional um, education programs? Yes. And yeah, we've got a uh, long-standing, wonderful relationship here with, uh, with Pacific. A lot of um, students in their dental hygiene or pharmacy or um, optometry programs may come through our clinic. They ask the um, Pacific I clinic in our Cornelius, I mean Cornelius is in our building, and Virginia Garcia's um, clinic in Hillsboro is in a Pacific building, <laughs> uh, uh, as well as uh, our, our Beaverton clinic has a Pacific University classroom uh, in it for, uh, for all of the learners that are, that are going through there. Um, and then because um, yeah, we are part of this, the broader healthcare system, we also have you know, relationships with OHSU and Legacy and Kaiser and all of, all of that piece of the, the puzzle, because they're, um, yeah, they're just, when people have great primary health care, the strain on the specialty care becomes reduced, and so there's just a mutual interest in everybody doing well there, yeah. But uh, we also partner with uh, uh, Linfield and Portland Community College and some other places who have the health professions programs, uh, uh, including a, a, new, a new relationship with um, the Hillsborough School District, as well as some other high school students in the medical track have been um, you know, doing some rotations in our clinics, too. So, Really part of our workforce development um, programs. Uh, so that's those are great pieces of that as well because we're not unique in having uh, staffing challenges, uh, and so we're looking at all the ways that we can um, creative ways we can help kind of create um, and looking ahead who, who, who can join us down the road. So yeah, with, uh, with high school kids. Yeah. I just want to compliment you on the reaching out you've done with um, I work for Carol Parker's Hospice. Okay. So being a nonprofit and you being a nonprofit, it's nice that we support each other on that. We've had many of your patients and so thank you. For that. Thank you. <laughs> and then I also have the benefit of using their clinic for my COVID and uh, walking right in after I tried fabulous to get an appointment before I was leaving on a trip. So lovely to see how the process worked and I too go <coughs> way back when you know, said when people were lined up down the street and as a church we were bringing food to the doctors that volunteered to see those people. So you've come a long way. Well, thank you so much for having us. Thank you.